So yeah, um, that was my bio. Um, I'm basically an imposter here. I'm not a data scientist, but I come from the, um, the telco world, from the internet service provider or networking world. So this is also a story of a multidisciplinary sort of research that I did with my colleagues, which is the kind of thing that you, you should look at in machine learning and AI today, I believe. So all this starts from looking at the statistics, the, what is so-called the dwell time, which is basically a measure of how much time passes in networking before you realize that your network has been compromised. And if, if you see reports, usually they, um, they claim something like around 100 days, which is three months, which is crazy, because it's like saying, you know, you operate a corporate network and you don't realize that for three months your network has been compromised. There is an attacker that has access to your network, which is crazy. So typically, the, the main reason we see today with our customers is IoT. And by IoT, I mean, you know, a random Internet of Things devices of any vendor. And in this example, a smaller Raspberry Pi, which, as, as you must have heard, is a small um, computer, basically, which can be used for many things. So in this example, let's say this, this is a temperature sensor or a humidity sensor or whatever, and it's periodically sending data back to the cloud, to a cloud backend. But it's also doing other um, activities, for example, synchronizing the clock, or sending statistics, or telemetry, or updating the firmware, or whatever. So, you know, up to here, if you have a, a small deployment, you could just follow the traditional approach of setting prescriptive firewall rules to determine what can, be, what can these devices do and what cannot, what type of network traffic is allowed and what is not. But, you know, typically things tend to expand in the world, right? Entropy always increases. So after a while, you find yourself with a larger deployments, with a lot of devices and, you know, at some point, some of them might be at remote locations, they might be dialing in your organization via VPN or via some weird data center tunnel. And also some of them might be from that particular vendor you bought several years ago and they are not updated anymore. So, you know, this is why uh, you might not realize that one of them has been compromised and now it is an insertion point from an attacker into your network. And typically, this is very hard to identify using traditional firewalling rules, because maybe this device is doing um, very low traffic, very little traffic, because it's just sending a keep alive to a remote uh, server controlled by the attacker. So we looked at this problem with, with several of our customers, and we tried to um, think, why, why don't we look at the problem upside down? Why don't we, instead of trying to control what kind of traffic these devices can do, why don't we allow everything? We allow every type of traffic. And instead, we try to determine what's the typical behavior of each individual device and see if they change behavior over time. So obviously, it's not something we invented. It, this is called user entity behavioral anomaly, uh, sorry, behavioral analytics, or UEBA, which is a whole market. And there are a lot of startups working in this field and a lot of mainstream vendors already there. We are a late entrant. But if you look at what most solutions are doing, they typically ask you, as a customer, to um, operate some sort of big data, big data backend. So you probably have to store uh, network flows or syslog entries or even network packets for a while. And then these are processed in batches. We, we instead want to differentiate ourselves by looking at an approach completely based on online learning, where basically we tell our customers we, we will look at the data only once and then we will throw it away. So we will ingest network data live and we won't require you to store anything at all. And beside being much cheaper from an operational perspective, it's also much simpler from a legal or privacy-related perspective because uh, many of our customers are in highly regulated industries, such as healthcare or finance, where uh, even the, the fact that you have data is toxic, it's expensive. So um, using online learning is, is a real facilitator for them, keeps the opportunity cost down. So the inspiration for this work come from natural language processing, and um, particularly from all the work that has started from 2014, 15, and over the last couple of years, starting with word to vec and up to um, the recent advancements. And probably, I, I don't have to explain the, the, the basics to this audience, I guess, but um, the, 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 the core of modern natural language processing is the idea of word embedding. The idea that the meaning of a word can be determined by looking at the context in which the word appears most of the time. And what is known typically as the distributional hypothesis, 
which dates back from, uh, from the 50s, with the idea that you shall know a word by the company it keeps, meaning you, you can determine what's the meaning of a word in English by looking at what um, are the words that fall next to it typically in English books or sentences and so on. And this is the canonical example you always see in tutorials of word to vec um, where you see um, that you can use word embeddings, so vector representation of words, to do analogies, to do grammar conjugation of verbs, or going from masculine to feminine, and, and so on, or even to do higher-order analogies, such as going from a country to its capital. And in fact, these were used in the past a lot, even for um, things like um, basic artificial intelligence for chatbots. But you know, I come from networking again, so my context is not spoken languages like English or Italian or French. It's networking. So can we model, can we use this um, recent advancement in NLP to model made-up languages, such as synthetic language of networking? What if we say that a network flow for us is a word, and the, the ensemble of all the words generated by or from uh, an individual device is a document? Right, then we would be able to determine what's the typical topic of, of conversation of that particular temperature sensor and determine whether it changes over, the over time. So what we did was uh, uh, building a small prototype which is using a set of features from layer three and above in, network, in the networking stack to, to generate um, synthetic words, like in this example, taking things from a lower layer in the stack and up to the packet inspection which we operate in real time on the traffic we see on our access point and switches and routers. And, and then we apply a sort of advanced word to vec where we implemented a, a few mathematical tricks to adapt it to a, a synthetic language, a made up language like this one. Uh, in particular because we are not using English or uh, any spoken languages, the size of the vocabulary is not naturally limited. So we do a few tricks to try to bound the maximum size of the vocabulary, otherwise it will grow to infinity. And also, we, generate, we, we don't only learn a, a vector representation for each word, but for each subfield in the word you saw earlier, so that we have actual meaning or vector representation of the meaning of individual networking concepts, such as a packet being TCP rather than UDP. So what we end up having is a, um, batches of flows per each device over the last few minutes across the network. So let's imagine device A in this example is a temperature sensor. And let's say over the last few minutes we saw four individual flows. So we pass them through our um, modified word to vec approach and we, um, in output we get vector representation. So basically large arrays of flows for each flow. But in practice, you know, many flows you will see on the network on this synthetic language are, will be very similar in reality. So what we do is we cluster them into a manageable number to keep the number low. And we do this by using cosine similarity with a particular implementation that we did so that we can run them in, in a few milliseconds across all the flows um, that cross the network over the last few minutes. Then we look at the similarity between any pair of flows and we group together those that are more similar than a given threshold, which basically saying um, all the flows that are almost identical, let's consider them as one. We also keep a, a tiny state for each individual device, which describes the typical behavior of the device, which is basically um, the last clusters of flows um, that these devices has generated over the, over the recent past. And these clusters, they are basically moving average of flows um, that are similar together. Um, and also you will, you will notice that these clusters are time-stamped so that we can update the behavior of a device by pruning away the um, clusters that, that, that have not been seen for a while. So what we do then is taking the flows from the recent batch and compare them in similarity with the cluster that we have for this particular temperature sensor. We then take the maximum and we feed those maximum into a quantile sketch algorithm, which is a fancy way of uh, describing an algorithm that keeps track of what are the, the percentile, the quantiles, for a particular distribution while keeping the storage bounded in size. So what the user sees from a UI perspective is a single slider like this one, where you can set what's the minimum confidence you want the algorithm to have for the, al for the alerts that you want to receive. 
So it's like saying if you slide it all over to the left, you will receive an alert for every flow where we are not really certain that is an anomaly. If you uh, push it all to the right, you will only see alerts for things that we are absolutely sure that they are anomalies. What this means from a data science perspective is that we are extracting the corresponding quantile from the sketch, which we call beta in this example. So it's from 0 to 1, basically, or 0 to 100. And what we do then is basically taking the, uh, the last row in the, in the comparison table you saw earlier, which is basically the maximum similarity between the new flows and the existing clusters, and if uh, there is any previous cluster that is more similar than the threshold, then this is not an anomaly. I mean, we have seen a behavior similar to this one, so we are fine. But if there isn't, then this is a new behavior from this temperature sensor. So if it's um, further than beta, then we should alert the administrator and also create a, um, a cluster for the future so that we don't keep alerting the user over and over. So we also, in our, in our UI, we also generate a, a very simple dimensionality reduction visualization, um, where you see here a dot for each individual mm, IoT endpoint in the network. And they are colored based on, um, basically, the type of device, the MAC address of the device. But this is not an information that we pass to the algorithm. So the fact that you see clusters that are similarly colored, lying link, link next to each other on the, on the 3D plot, that's not something we told the algorithm, right? That's something that the algorith algorithm has determined based just on the behavior by looking only at the flows. So if you were to see, um, for example, a red dot coming from the cloud of red dots, which are, let's say, temperature sensor moving away from the cloud of the other temperature sensor, that will also tell you that something is different fr for this individual device compared to the rest of its peers. And this visualization is live, and in the, actually in this example, it's taken from a data set of a customer of ours that is operating a very large scientific park, like a, a very large uh, laser accelerometer, where they have tens of thousands of custom-built scientific piece of equipment, and they don't even know exactly what these devices are doing, because it's a very large deployment, because they are all custom devices using all sorts of, all sort of IoT protocols. So this visualization not only is useful for um, security, but also gives the network administrator an idea of what's going on in their network. At least you get an idea of, uh, you know, I have a sizable crowd of devices that are behaving similarly to this one that I know what it is doing in reality. So that's all nice and fun, and this is uh, going through early trials with customers, but what's next? So as future directions, we are looking at multiple things. Ideally, what we want to build is a zero footprint and augmented federated edge wire speed behavioral modeling. And that's a mouthful. What does that mean? So when I, say, when I say zero footprint, as I said earlier, I mean we always want to uh, build solutions which don't require the user to store any data in the backend for operational and for legal reasons. And also that keeps the opportunity cost down. We don't want to ask the user, hey, you know what, you have to install a rack full of equipment for running this application. We want to be able to say, you already have a virtual machine in your data center, which is all, controlling all your access points in your venue. You know what, you can also install this other lightweight virtual machine, and we will do um, the machine learning magic on there, basically. When I say on, on, on augmented, what I mean is we want to skip the feature engineering part altogether. That slide I showed earlier with the, um, the, the, the feature that we are using to generate the synthetic words, we want to drop it completely. It would, ideally, we would, um, we would want to ingest raw byte data, raw packet data. And even if nowadays most of networking data is encrypted, there are still plenty of metadata, for example, during the TLS encryption phase, uh, handshake phase, that are um, um, either unencrypted or they represent entropy, for example, related to certificates. Which, is not, uh, which doesn't change across connections. And, and, and this approach, ideally, would uh, allow us to also to automatically learn long-term dependencies between flows. This comes from, um, it, it, this is an approach which takes ideas from computer vision rather than NLP, so it's a fusion between these two fields that we are looking at right now. Another approach that we are, another direction we are looking at today is federated learning, because if you, today you buy or you install this software, it will learn 
everything from scratch. So we are not doing any sort of transfer learning whatsoever. Every new deployment starts with an empty model with complete random weights and biases. So what if we found a way to share this, these weights between customers while preserving anonymity of their network, or of the type of data that goes on in their network? That would be ideal, right? You would get a cure, higher accuracy sooner, and also as a byproduct, we would get a higher order um, cloud-based repository of networking concepts, which we could use, for example, to transfer information about uh, security attacks between customers and provide early alerts about on ongoing threats. And finally, up to here, all our implementation is pure CPU x86 commodity-based. We believe this will, we will hit a wall if we keep on this road, obviously, because most of what I describe in this slide cannot be done in real time on a CPU, despite all the optimization we are attempting. So we are looking at embedding um, edge, TPU, edge TPUs or embedded GPUs directly into the edge hardware. And when I say edge hardware, I mean actually switches, routers, or access points on the roof. As you know, most of these pieces of hardware, they come from either home assistant, like Alexa or um, um, Google Home, or from the automobile industry, for, for example, for self-driving. So this is a very novel field, and there isn't really anyone setting the road for us. But we believe that um, because the prices, the cost of, of these devices is going down because of the economy of scale, we will eventually be able to have those directly on access points. So that's all I have. Thank you very much, and if you have any questions.